We're ending up this series called Seven Mile Miracle. And then during the month of June, when my family gets away a little bit, uh, my, my good friend and, you, and, and our church's favorite preacher, Mike Albritton, will be coming in in June. And, uh, and he is an amazing man of God. He'll be preaching a series called I Can Only Imagine. And we'll have a, we'll have a great, great month of June. I wish I could be here with you guys. And so today we're finishing up this series, Seven Mile Miracle. Let's look at Luke 23, 44. It says, it was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For sun had stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, and here's the last saying from the cross. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Now let's look over into the next chapter, 24, verse 33. He says, he says this is of the two travelers we have been tracking, these travelers. What's their names? Cleo, his mama named him Cleopas, but we didn't want to say all that. Him and his unnamed companion, probably his wife. And then it says, after they had had this encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ on Sunday morning of Easter. It says, they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those with them assembled together. And they were saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And the two told what had happened along the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself showed up. He stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. What had happened along the way as these two travelers were, were walking, Jesus walks up to them, and you know the story by now, and he asks them this question, what are you talking about? And I love it how God enters into your situation today. Did anybody have a situation? Are you ready for God to enter into that situation? And so he, he enters in at the point that you are talking about. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh-oh. What did you say? And so he says, he walks up to them and says, what are you talking about? And it's funny how Jesus comes in and they're all full of questions. But Jesus doesn't answer the question. He gives them a question. And sometimes in our lives, in order for God to answer my question, he has to fix my question. I'm sorry, that question doesn't have an answer. I remember algebra. I'm be trying to get those equations right, trying to get that equation down. But I remember one time my teacher said to me, you got the equation wrong, David. And sometimes in life I got the equation wrong, and sometimes you got the equation wrong. And there's not, you can't balance that equation. You need the right equation. You need the right question. And Jesus exchanges their question, their old question, for a new question. What are you talking about? And sometimes we don't have the right question. Like, we'll ask for a blessing. Anybody ask for blessing in your life? We'll ask for blessing, but you don't even know what blessing is. We think blessing is a thing, is an outcome. We think blessing is an answer. When the blessing walked up and asked a question. And so he walks up and asks that question, and, and sometimes we don't even know what the blessing is. See, blessing is really just a state of your heart. It's a state of your heart that keeps you content no matter what the circumstances is. And so Jesus asked them in Luke 24, 17, what are you discussing together as you walk along the way? And the Bible says they stood still, their faces downcast. I mean, a question that makes you stand still. Some of you have trouble standing still, don't you? Some of you are very, very busy people. 
very busy. I'm so, I'm so busy. I, I'm just so busy. But there are certain questions in life that stop you. And so this question stopped them. It stopped them because their dreams had been dashed. Their dreams of a savior, their dreams of God coming in the flesh, the dreams of their nation being redeemed, of them having prosperity and promise and purpose. Their dreams had been dashed on the rocks of the reality of the death, the one they had believed that was the Messiah. They're standing right there in that moment next to hope, but they have no hope. They're standing right there in that moment next to strength, but they're feeling weak. Anybody felt weak this week? That's why they call it a week. Because you get to Sunday, and it's no longer that week. You get a new week, and it's not weak. You never thought of that before, did you, Don? You thought of that before, Don? That's why they call it weak. See, usually Don thinks of everything. If I ever think of something ahead of Don, I get real excited. So if you're taking notes this morning, your first point is this, return, return. And Jesus says, what y'all talking about? It's all one word. Don't you think Jesus threw it out there like, like some Alabama boy? What y'all talking about? It's all one word. What's Cleo talking about? What's Cleo's companion talking about? What's his wife talking about? And then they begin to talk to Jesus about all the bad things that had happened to Jesus. And it's like talking to the author about how the book turned out, trying to tell that author what the end of the book turned out to be. Like, like, like talking to J.K. Rowling and telling her how, what happened to Harry Potter. See, let me tell you all about Harry. She knows. Because their hope hung there on the cross. And they're talking to the one who was no longer there on the cross. See, a lot of things in life, we put places, and we just think nothing can ever change, and we lose our hope about them, and then after they have already changed, our hearts have not yet changed, even though the circumstance has changed. See, that's why that blessing is not a circumstance. It's a condition of my heart. And then let's look at Luke 24, 20, about return. It says, the chief priests and our rulers, this is Cleo and Mrs. Cleo talking to Jesus about Jesus. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, crucified him. Those shouts that they cried out, what should I do with this Jesus? Pilate asked. And the Jews shouted out, crucify him. The Pharisees cried out, crucify him. The ones who had shouted glory to his name the week before, Hosanna as he who comes in the name of the Lord, were now shouting out, crucify him. And these, these travelers said, this is what happened. They crucified him. And don't you think they thought now heard the cry, crucify him. I'm going to tell you a word. You ready for a brand new word? You know, the Bible was written in this original language of Greek. And honestly, even the Greek language being all over that then known world and being a refined language with, with meaning and depth that our English doesn't have and, and our, most of our modern languages do not have, that Greek language being a, a, a language spoken all over the Roman Empire was even part of the coming of the time for Jesus to be born so that the word of God, Jesus, the word, could be wrapped and told about and messaged in words that were the height of that, that communication. And so sometimes out of the, the Bible, we can get these original words. And there's a word in this passage that says they handed him over. See, I underlined it for you there. They handed him over. It's the word called paradidomai. Like, look at the person next to you and give them a paradidomai. Paradidomai. Just tell them para, paradidomai. You're not telling somebody paradidomai. I can tell. You're not, you didn't do that, Renee. I can tell. You didn't give them a paradidomai. See, for a drummer, I'm a drummer, but when I hear paradidomai, I, I think about paradiddle. You don't know what a paradiddle is, do you? 
You know what paradiddle is? Paradiddle is like when you go like right, left, right, right. Left, right, left, left. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, right, left. Paradiddle. So I, it helps me remember it. It's not a paradiddle, just so you know. It's paradidomai. Paradidomai. And the meaning is handed over. The meaning is handed over. See, these travelers were talking to Jesus about Jesus, not knowing it was Jesus, because the resurrected form of Jesus, they were looking for a dead man, and they, were, and, and they met, a, met a man who was alive and resurrected. And these travelers were speaking to Jesus, and it says, the rulers handed him over. Paradidomai. And so that, that word is when Jesus... When Judas handed Jesus over on that Thursday night in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the temple guards came, he handed them over to the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, paradidomai. And the Sanhedrin handed him over to Caiaphas, the high priest, paradidomai. And Caiaphas handed him over to Pilate, the Roman governor, to execute Roman justice, like in this sham of a trial against our Lord, paradidomai. And Pilate sent him to Herod to try to get the, the, the Jewish kings, the, the installed Jewish king from the Roman government to get his okay on the deal. Try to get him to take the blame. Paradidomai over to Herod. And Herod's guards, they mocked him and made sport of him and handed him over to the soldiers to be crucified. Paradidomai. Handed over. Handed him over. And these two disciples, Cleo and Mrs. Cleo, they, they, they they talked about him being crucified. And when they talked about him being crucified, really what they were saying was this, our hope was crucified. You ever been at a time in your life that your hope it was just crucified? You lost somebody. You were not supposed to lose. You failed in a certain way you were never thought you'd fail in. You went back to that same sin sickness that you never, you, you just swore you'd never do. Our hope was handed over because of what had happened to Jesus. And they're telling Jesus about it. Luke 24, 21 says, But we had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. They had hoped. Now they were headed home. They had hoped it'd be different this time. They had hoped he was going to break their chains. We had hoped he'd heal our disease. We had hoped that he'd take away the addiction. We had hoped that when we prayed for peace, we'd get peace. But now it's over. We had hope, but it's over now. And so our hope hung on the cross. And we're headed home with no hope, no hope at all. And hope shows up. Who showed up? Hope showed up. I don't blame them really for heading home at that point because after everything they had seen, I don't blame them for the fact that they head home. What else are they going to do when life hits you? You ever had life hit you so hard? I remember playing yard football. And that boy tackled me out in the front yard so hard, knocked knocked all the breath out of me. You ever had the breath just knocked out of you completely? I'd rather go back and get hit by that boy again. I'm bigger now than to have some of the thing, other things that have happened along the way in life. When the breath gets knocked out of you. And so they went back to their familiar ways to Emmaus. It's just seven miles. See, I understand that they went back. But here's something I don't understand. I don't understand the timing. You ever been like you've been... I think, okay, you did that, but I don't understand the timing. Why you did it now? See, Jesus told them he was going to die. He told them it'd be three days. He told them he'd be down in the ground for a minute, but he'd be back up. He told them. 
Look at Luke 24, 21, the second part of the verse. And it said, and they say, what is more? Like, what is more? See, like, I'm going to tell you something more than just he was crucified. What's more than that, the third day right now, since all this took place. Remember my question about the timing? I don't understand the timing. Because here's, here's the question. See, they held out as long as they could hold out, but they didn't hold out long enough. Sometimes in your life, you hold out as long as you can hold out. But I got to tell you today, hold out a little bit longer. They held out as long as they could hold out. They didn't even wait to the end of the third day. It's like halfway through the mid-morning. of like I need a snack. I got to get home to get a snack. I don't know what it was going on for them, but they wasn't even, it wasn't even to lunchtime yet. And they were headed home on the third day. It's like they had to check out of the Motel 6 at 11 o'clock to get home or something. See, our problem is we quit so quick. I mean, you quit right before the breakthrough sometimes. You ever seen somebody quit just, just seconds before something happened? They get so close. Say, God, don't let me be somebody that gets so close and loses it out. See, I put my bet on the real thing, Jesus, and I'm not going to sell off my bet because sometimes it gets dark. See, the first thing that happened when he rose, he appeared to the women. And then, and then the women went and talked to the men, the, some of the disciples, and they could not get it through their hard heads. You know, sometimes men are hard-headed. Sometimes men are stubborn. They got to do it themselves. Can I get a little estrogen praise right here this morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And see, <laughs> and so then the men, you know, Peter and they ran on to the, to the tomb. They ran onto the tomb, and Peter was late. John got there, but John stopped short, and Peter went into the tomb. And So here's the story in the setting here. And then here comes in the travelers, and they, they heard that he was risen from the dead. They heard that the tomb was empty. They say, well, I guess that's just for the Peters and Johns of the world. It's just for the special people. They get to see the empty tomb. I mean, I, mean we, I wasn't one of the 12, so he's probably not caring about me like, like that. I mean, like they wasn't chosen in kickball one time in the third grade and still got a complex about it. Can I get a witness? I still remember the moment I wasn't chosen in kickball. Anyway, I'm sorry, that's too personal. <laughs> that's way too personal. So, like, they got a complex about it, and they, and, and they know about the empty tomb, and they still go home to Emmaus. Seven miles. Aren't you glad that when you decide to quit, we have a Jesus who won't let you quit? He'll come and get you. They almost missed it, like people leaving at the end of church at the invitation. They almost missed it. Uh, there were some guys yesterday, we went on a fishing trip, and there were some guys who almost missed it. I came back to the church to uh, bring Hannah something after we had gotten out to the, to the Bucks Farm Lake. And, and, and we and came back to bring Hannah something. I had taken her something, her, her, her special bottle that she likes to drink out of. And so, you know, now I got my own. So I'd taken hers. And, uh, and so I brought it back. I brought it back. And then I was glad I brought it back because, you know, we, I had, to get some, I had to get the van started for the youth group, and all that was good. But then I found me a Chris Wright in the parking lot. And then I looked around, and I found me a John Fleet in the church parking lot. By the time we got back out to the lake, Brian Lee and his daddy had already caught 100 fish together. I mean, they missed out. But they didn't totally miss out. I got a Cleo and a Chris and a Mrs. Cleo and John. I'm just joking about that. But it's like what came and got them. I walked up to him. What y'all talking about? Sometimes you almost miss out. It's okay. John and Chris, they caught, they caught, they caught, they caught, they caught, they caught. I mean, when we told you, when you told you guys, like, you ever want to fish and, like, only catch? This was the thing. Mm. My second point today after the. You know, after we talk about the return, my second point today is the reveal. The reveal. Resurrection reveals the power of God to all who believe, but not like you think all the time. Um, 
See, I, I know about the strength of Jesus when I talk about the resurrection. You know, like he, he pushes his own stone away from the tomb. He chokes out death, and death taps three times. And he kills death. That's strong. I know about that. I know about the sovereignty of Jesus. He's all-powerful. That's a good church word. It means all-powerful. Sovereignty. Over death, over hell, over the grave. But I got one more S for you on this second point. It's not just strength, not just sovereignty. But I'll tell you something you've never been told about Jesus. He's sneaky. Do you know Jesus is sneaky? See, while it was still dark, he knocked the guards up out of the way and snuck out while it was dark. And when he appeared to the people, he appeared to a few ladies and not even a whole bunch of people at, the, at, at first. And that's why when he was born as a baby, he was born in Bethlehem. He wasn't born in a political capital, but in a backwoods town. Anybody else born in a backwoods town? I was born in a small town. See, Jesus saying country, I don't think so. See, you never heard a sermon called Sneaky Jesus. Maybe we should do a whole series on Sneaky Jesus. Um, Watch how he comes up to Cleo. What y'all talking about? Never mind the fact, like, you are God. Never mind the fact that you're resurrected, all powerful, ready to judge the living and the dead and sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God, able to walk through walls and appear and disappear and do anything and everything and ascend to heaven. He can do it all. And he walks up and he sneaks in on them. Just what y'all talking about? What's he doing? He's creeping on Cleo. He's creeping in on Cleo. I don't ever heard preaching like this before. I thought about this. I read it in, the, in our Seven Mile Miracle book, and God shows up. He's spectacular. But we always expect it to be spectacular no matter what the circumstance is. I mean, when I open up the door to my beautiful home, I do it with a tiny little key. We always expect it to be spectacular or something big to happen. No, no, no. He's very sneaky sometimes. He's super sneaky sometimes. And he'll sneak in in ordinary situations. Can I get an amen on that one? He'll sneak in in ordinary moments with no advance notice. You don't have to you don't get you to sign a waiver. There's no sign in the clouds because he's sneaky. See, he, when Peter was in the storm, Jesus walks in on water. And they're like, ah, it's a ghost. No, it's Jesus. Ah, it's a ghost. No, it's Jesus. He's sneaky. He snuck up on them when the doors were locked and they were waiting and wondering what was going to happen. And he appeared on them and he said, peace to them. He snuck up on Cleo. And what makes you think he's not sneaking up into your situation this morning? Don't you think he's sneaking in on your situation? Just because you can't feel him doesn't mean he's not with you. He's right there. He sneaks out of the tomb. He sneaks up on Cleo and then he's up on the cross. And when he's on the cross, he died. He brought victory to the earth. But he couldn't bring victory in this obvious way. He had to dress it up and make it look like death. And hang it on a cross because he's sneaky. He couldn't bring glory into your life and make it look like glory. He doesn't bring blessing into my life all the times and make it look like blessing. See, he'll bring patience into your life and make it look like the job you have. He'll bring patience into your life and make it look like your marriage or your singleness. He'll bring patience into your life and make it look like your teenager. Or if you're a teenager, make it look like your parents. He'll dress up your best times in your life and make them look like your worst times in your life. And you only see it later. You only see it later. Mm. On the cross, he says that word tetelestai that we looked at last week means it's finished, it's accomplished. The mission is accomplished. The debt's paid, but it's accomplished, it's done. And so when he says that, it's kind of this sneaky word from the cross because it's like it's over. Like they're, they're thinking like, we got him, he's done, he's almost dead, it's almost over. And when he wanted to bring life to the earth, He snuck it in through death. 
He brought in life. He snuck it in through death. And so and sometimes in our life, when he wants to bring you strength, he'll sneak it in through sorrow. And we usually don't understand it until the return trip. You see, he went all seven miles, and they kept They were kept from recognizing him. What are you being kept from recognizing in your life today? Because you can't recognize the situation until you recognize the Savior in the situation. I can't be saved from it until I recognize the Savior in it. See, he sat down at the table. Watch how sneaky he is. He breaks the bread like his body was broken, like their hope was broken. See, it always happens the same way in our lives, too. See, you're, you're broken before you see the glory of God. You're broken before you see the glory of God. Verse 26 says, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? See, glory never looks like glory when it's on the way. Glory never looks like glory when it's coming. Now think about it. He sat down at the table. He takes the bread with Cleo and Mrs. Cleo when he gets to Emmaus, I guess to Cleo's mama's house. Takes the bread, holds it, breaks it, shows them his arms. They see the scars. They recognize him in that moment. All those first seven miles, did he have the scars those first seven miles? Was he Jesus those first seven miles? Was he resurrected those first seven miles? It takes a minute to walk seven miles. All the time they thought they were alone, they were with the Lord. All the time they thought they were abandoned, they had the God of the universe walking with them. What do you think that is for you today? What do you think that is for me? See, I want some body to fix me. I want some person. I want some situation. I want some money to fix it. I I want some body else. You get nobody till you get Jesus. Verse 24, 26. Did not the Messiah have to suffer before entering to his glory? Hmm. See, that's how it is. It's after you've run. It's after you've hurt. It's after you've tried and you tried and you tried and you tried. And then what'd you do after that? You tried It was him all along. He had to suffer. He says he he had to suffer. Did not the Messiah have to suffer, Jesus told them? See, you don't get it while you're in it. Sometimes our memory, like, you know, like think about family vacation. It's summertime. Sometimes your memory is much more enjoyable than the experience. Like, you remember taking pictures with the family? You look back at the picture, oh, it looks so sweet. Nobody was being sweet. I mean, like, we go to take those sunrise beach pictures with, my, with our family. I'm so glad we got them. It's such this gorgeous, beautiful experience. It was horrible. It was a fight in the van on the way over to the beach. Where's the photographer? Mm. Our memory is much more enjoyable sometimes than the experience. See, you don't see it when you're in it. But the resurrection is a round trip. Look at verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those who were with them assembled together. See, in this series, I'm calling it Seven Mile Miracle from that Pastor Furtick's book, Seven Mile Miracle. But really, it's a 14-mile miracle. Did you get it? It's actually a 14-mile miracle. See, if you don't take the round trip, you don't get the point of it all. You can't just do it halfway. See, the first seven, they walked without the light. In the second seven, they walked in freedom, in the light, in beauty, in passion, in love. Now they knew. Now they knew. You ever heard of like, you know, now you see it, now you don't? Now you see it, now you don't. For them, it was now you don't see it. Uh Uh-oh, now you do. The second seven miles. See, I want you to tell you this. Today, somebody needs to hear this today in this room. Today, somebody needs to hear this. It is your second seven miles are starting this morning. 
Your second seven miles is starting this morning. Is it you? Who is it today? God wants to say it to you in your life. Your second seven miles is starting today. Now you see it. Now you see it. It's turnaround time. Can you say it with me? Punch your neighbor on the shoulder and say, it's turnaround time. Well, Becky done hit her mama down here on the front row. It's turnaround time. Woo. That's punch your mama Sunday. It's bad. It's turnaround time. I know, I know, it's my fault. I'll take the blame. See, the first seven miles, they walked in shame, and the second seven miles, they walked in freedom. See, it was freedom long before William Wallace yelled freedom. See, today, you want to say it with me, it's my turning point. Say it with me. It's my turning point. I'm not staying in Emmaus. I ain't staying in Mama's house in Emmaus. I got a job back in Jerusalem. I got some place to go. So they walked back in Luke 24 to Jerusalem. They got together with the other disciples. Jesus snuck into the room and said, peace to them. And that's that last point today, the third point. Release. Release the peace. Say it with me. Release the peace, Jesus. Release the peace. Oh, if you have a bad day this week, a bad moment, you better say it before you have a bad moment. Release the peace, Jesus. Release the peace. Jesus showed up in the room and said, peace, oh, I need that in my house. I need it in my heart. See, there's a difference between the reveal and the release. What iPhone are we up to now? iPhone 27. You know, Steve Jobs, can you see that picture of Steve Jobs standing up there in the black turtleneck? Cool, Steve Jobs. And he's up there, you know, for, for first the iPod, you know, and he has the reveal. And you can't get it for like... 30 more weeks, but he's going to show it to you. And now we're up to like iPhone. Which one is it really? I don't actually know. 10, okay, I'm sorry. iPhone X, right? Yeah, you got it, right, Douglas? That's what I thought. I thought Douglas probably had it. He was bragging the other day about it, I think. He was was digital post about it. I think he showed pictures of it, smiling with it, you know, setting it down beside his cheesecake, you know. But, uh. (laughs) <laughs> how long ago was it that they, that they revealed the iPhone 10? then you just salivate over that thing you just want it, it was line up afterwards y'all can touch Douglas's iPhone 10 <laughs> I mean you can't actually touch it but you can look at it and so he's right there and then people stand in line stand in line all night long Talking about it like, I heard it's going to be like this. I thought it was going to be like that. I wonder if it's going to be like the other thing. Here comes the band. We're getting to the end of the service. See, I I don't ever know when the end of the service is. They have to come and let me know. (laughs) See, there's a difference between the reveal and the release. There's a space between the reveal and the release. That's where hope gets lost sometimes, in that space. That space is called Saturday between the crucifixion and the resurrection, where you thought God was gonna. Are you there with me? Where you thought God was gonna? You just knew God was gonna? You were sure that person that they would never, and they did. That's called space. That's where faith grows. Between those two points, say it with me. That's where my faith grows. Between those two points, between the reveal and the release. The reveal of the promise and the release of the peace. Mm. That's what the cross was. The cross was the space between the reveal of Jesus. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Three years later, he's coming down the Mount of Olives and they're singing his praises. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, he's the comes the king. Let the king of glory come in. The reveal. Then there's that space all week long in the crucifixion where their hope died. 
And then the release, when they finally realize it, he breaks the bread like your life has been broken. He breaks the bread like our hope sometimes gets broken. He breaks the bread and now you see his scars. And if he's got scars, that means he's been healed. And if you've got scars in your life, and if you've got wounds, that means you can be healed too. You can be healed too. That's where my faith grows. My faith grows in the space uh, through all those seven words of Christ on the cross and we get here to the last one Luke 23 46 Jesus called out with a loud voice father into your hands I commit my spirits when he said this he breathed his last the sky grew black for three hours when he breathed his last but his last breath was my first breath death was not his final destination it's a round trip Resurrection. Say it with me. Say release again. Say release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looked like the end when it was really the beginning. It was grace dressed up like shame. It was triumph dressed up like trouble. Mm. See, Luke wrote about this, but Luke wasn't there. Remember, we learned that the only disciple at the cross was John. And so Luke learned about it. Luke researched it. Luke put it down, but John really saw it. And John snuck something in when he wrote his gospel. Look at John 19, 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. So far, so good. Luke and John seeing it together. But then it says something a little bit different. In Luke, it says he breathed his last. But in John, who saw it, He says, he gave up his spirit. Guess what that word is, ladies and gentlemen? He gave up his spirit. It's paradidomai. It's handed over. He handed over his spirit. Just like Judas handed him over to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin handed him over to Caiaphas. Caiaphas to Pilate. Pilate to Herod. Herod to the soldiers. Handed over to be crucified. What I'm trying to say to you is this. He handed over his spirit. Nobody took it from him. He gave it. He gave it for you. He gave it for me. So hand it over. That's the invitation today. Hand it over. Will you guys stand with me as we close today? Hand it over. Hand it over. Hand it over. Hand it over. The same word that Jesus said. Used to, said he handed him over are the same words he used to give up his spirit. Paradidomai. It might have looked like Judas' hand was on it, but the hand of God was on the hand of Judas. Let me tell you this today. The hand of God was on your hand of your Judas too. The hand of God is still there. And that word paradidomai has a deeper meaning. It means hand over for keeping until the appropriate time. Hand over for keeping until the appropriate time. We're going to sing in a moment about how how precious is the love of God. How amazing is the love of God. How the love of God rescued me. How the love of God came for me. How the love of God handed over his life for me. Handed it over for keeping until the appropriate time to take it back up. And Cleo was standing there. It says they stood there still in disappointment. Hey, Cleo. You got some disappointment? Hand it over, Cleo. Hand it over. When you hand over your life, Cleo, you're handing over your disappointment. When you hand over your life, you're handing over your kids. When you hand over your life, you're handing over your job. When you hand over your life, you're handing over your marriage. When you hand over your life, you're handing over your finances. When you're handing over your life, you're handing over your joy, your peace, your love, your assurance, because you don't have any of that stuff. You can't even grasp it. You can't even feel it. You can briefly touch it for a moment and then it's gone. This life is so short. It's a breath. It's dust. But when I put it in the hands of Jesus, when I hand it over to the one whose life was handed over for me, he keeps it to the appropriate time when I get my own new resurrected body and I receive back all that I've ever handed over to him and tenfold, a hundred times fold, forever in all of eternity. So hand it over, Cleo. Hand it over. It says they they were discussing as they walked. What were you discussing this morning as you got up? What were you discussing this week? Hand it over. Hand over your regret, Cleo. Hand over your defeat. 
Hand over your excuses. Hand them all over to Jesus. How amazing is the love of God. Can you just open your hands like this and say, God, I hand it over to you. I hand it over to you. Let's sing and worship God. The love of God. The love of God. I hand it over to the love of God. Say it with me. I hand it over to the love of God.